coming. Welcome to this week's Culture Now. My name is Antonia Blocker. I'm the Associate Curator of Talks here at the ICA. It's my great pleasure to welcome Peter Golding and Chris Sullivan um, this week. And Peter created the world's first designer gene, including the world's first stretch denim gene. In 1975, he set up the iconic boutique Ace on Kings Road, where his clientele included the Rolling Stones, David Bowie, and Marshall. Judy Christie and Elizabeth Taylor, among many others, I'm sure. And aside from designing, he is also a distinguished blues musician and a rock and roll art collector. He'll be joined in conversation um, by Chris Sullivan, who has worked variously as a DJ, a nightclub host, pop star, painter, and fashion designer. He was the founder and director of the famous Wag Club in London, and he's now working as a freelance journalist and writer. Uh, he's the author of two books, Punks and We Can Be Heroes, which is a chronicle of club culture in the 1980s. Please join me in welcoming Peter and Chris. Well, thank you all for coming. And, uh, um, well, the introduction was uh, put the words right out of my mouth. So I think the first question I'd like to ask, Peter, is Fashion Weekly described you as the Eric Clapton of denim. <laughs> Can you answer that one? No, please. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming as well, by the way. <laughs> I don't know, it was just something they came up with. Uh, yeah, I mean, Eric Clapton's sort of been there forever, and yet he had it just well rooted and grounded in the early blues. So I suppose I've been well grounded in, in the early days of fashion and denim and uh, construction of uh, clothing. So. They stuck it there, and I thought it was quite good, so kept on using well, it. Well, maybe as well, because he's taken the, the classic form, blues, and yes. put it towards a, an audience who hitherto wouldn't sure. have heard it, which sure. is what you do, did. Right, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And um, where did it all start then, Peter? Well, uh, shall we go to the next one then? Well, it started way before this. This is sort of towards the end. Let's just see if that works. That's, well, I was in the fashion world before I went to Paris. Uh, uh, but uh, if we started in Paris, that was sort of the great escape for me. Uh, suburban London, uh, great family, but felt I had to sort of get a bit more independence. Can everybody hear me, by the way? Yeah. Okay, yes. good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And um, a pal of mine was going to Paris, to st Mike, who said, you know, he's an artist and I I'm going to live in Paris for a bit and hang around. I thought, wow, that sounds good. I'm going to go there too. So I gave up my job in the clothing world, young, young aged, and uh, went to Paris. Beat Hotel, which has suddenly become quite famous. At the time, it was a bit of a dump, number nine, G. Le Coeur. But to me, it's just heaven on earth, uh, which, uh, in fact, there was a film at the Chelsea Arts Club just only last week about it. And um, I bust the streets, uh, learned French, and, and really found myself, if you like, as many others did at the time. The, Beats were there, sort of early in the, uh, later in the, in the early in the fifties. Uh, I was there, sort of early sixties, and it was just something that was quite a magical moment. But I think it set the tone, and we all have these moments in time which set the tone for the rest of our life. And I think that did quite a lot. And then with my pal Mike, we drove scooters. You won't believe it, from Paris to Jerusalem, <laughs> twenty thousand kilometres, no phones, no faxes, no emails. No, nothing. Just letters from the American Express in, in two weeks' time when you got to Athens or Beirut or wherever it was. So that was pretty cool, and that's Mike and I arriving on our scooters, and that's with in the industry. In the so I think it set the tone, and there was a certain Anglo-American feel about it all. So, and I wore a pair of Levi's, by the way, most of the time. Well, that looks like it could be a fashion shoot from now. I mean, all of these photographs, mm -hmm. aren't yes. they, really? And of course, is that Madame Murray, was it? Madame Ra Rashu. Rashu, that's it. Yeah, He's the hero of all time. Yeah. And what was the significance of the, the Beats for you at the time as a movement? Well, it, it wasn't really because we weren't that aware of the Beats. Yeah, you know, yeah. where you, you, it's like it, it had happened, but it wasn't. Uh, the thing was, it was anti establishment, mm. and there was Shakespeare's bookshop nearby, and they just, uh, Henry Miller had written The Traffic of Cancer and Capricorn. So there was a certain challenge, anti establishment, but it wasn't anti establishment in banners and in. Mm. in, in uh, revolting sort of yeah. uh, political stages. It was more yeah. just a, a web of carelessly dropping out and getting on with something else and yeah. with music and hanging out. You suddenly find that you, you there's a whole lot of other people doing the same thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and you're not alone, and uh, it was quite an exciting time. Yeah. And of course, wearing jeans then as a it was quite a recent thing. It, it was. Nice. It was. I mean, it, happened to, it wasn't a fashion thing at all. No. No. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> this was pre Beatles, by the way. So <laughs> should we move on, Chris? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's go down to the to the classic stuff. So then I came back to England, and um, I managed to rejoin, uh, after being in the industry for a bit, with a company that uh, I had already worked for, um, Railbrook, and I rejoined them as a designer, having called up my mentor, may I say, John Traub, of which Stephen Traub is in the audience, so I thought I should just mention him, who gave me the opportunity to become a designer, which in those day, early days didn't really exist. It would be the chairman's wife that would go to the south of France and buy a few samples or something like that. So it was really an opportunity to make it a bit more professional. And my father actually was a, was a headmaster and in the educational business. So I, I felt that uh, I wanted to make it more a profession than just sort of a, an art. Uh, although in those days it was more artistic. There were dressmakers and Hardy Amy's and couture. And I just felt it should be more industrial. And the shirt uh, training that I had was actually really good because shirt is, is obviously a completely deconstructed clothing and that's why I suddenly got very excited in, in American workwear and in French workwear as well which is a complete constructional thing without the tailoring and without the sort of traditions of going back to Beau Brummel and everything else which was great so but not for me so I, I managed to get a few um, clients um, clothing world, uh, both in America and over here, and that sort of kept me going, and fees were quite good, so, uh, and I had a family by then, so uh, it, it worked out quite well, and that's, uh, this is something I think we did, uh, when I did uh, the Impact of Design in the 70s, I think it was um, a paper I gave which we called um, Engineering for Soul, in other words, uh, the clothing industry uh, should, should should still have feeling. And this was a whole thing within the design world. The feeling should also be important. It wasn't just a question of making something uh, which which was functional. There should be feeling, and it was formal function. There was a whole big argument of you know whether, whether a telephone can look like a banana. And, you know, <laughs> what about Railbrook? Because a lot of people yes. would be, they were probably the biggest. Railbrook were a big show company, company in those days, country. and it was just fortunate I was there, and they were taking on quite young people, and I was a management trainee before. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I went to Paris, so in fact the whole thing worked quite well, and this is some more, then I created the fashion, probably the first fashion design consultancy, mm. and little offices in North Burlington Street, and, and that's a picture of me, believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> you still got, still still got the beatnik yeah, angle still, going on there. Still, they never lost it. <laughs> and uh, that's the Esquire magazine, they had a big conference in America, and you know, I was sort of the young kid on the block amongst some of the older folk of the industry. So there you go, there. Move it along. Ah, 1970. This was when it started, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. What caused you to, to, to turn that around into a... Well, I got a call from, uh, it must have seen some publicity, from a guy in Orlando, actually, who had a company called Falma, and they were they made jeans. And he said, you know, we want, really want to develop the jeans for <coughs> industry uh, and the product more, and Peter, we, 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 we think you can help us out because we're more traditional. Because in those days, it was more sort of beige, Pants, I wouldn't say they were really jeans at all. So they called me in and they created Peter Golding for Falmer, which in 1970 was probably the first designer jean. Uh, in, in other words, it was a, a guy that actually designed the, the jean and had his name on it. So it was way before Gloria Vanderbilt and Calvin Klein and anybody else. So uh, arguably it's the first designer jean. But also, you already mentioned farmers was probably in every high street in, in Britain. Yes, they had very good distribution. The jean machine. There was, was it not, was it no, not? they weren't there yet, but they, Lee Cooper was Lee, the other yeah, one. Yeah, but but right, they, yeah. they were twill. They weren't really denim, and they were more different. But uh, and, and I was quite excited by the sort of young, young uh, look. And you can see we made these jeans. I had a fantastic girl called Judy Rance who used to do the drawing. She was absolutely fantastic, and she drew all these, the feeling... Of, of, of the product, There's, this is another one, look at that, and that was the front page of Menswear magazine, which was the the journal in those days that you had to be on, and they took a four page ad, and uh, there's a picture of me on Hampstead Heath wearing some old clothes, but you can see we changed the pockets, I don't know, the one on the left was an inset pocket, and the one in the back we changed the shape of the yoke and curve, I think I had a Sam Brown belt with a 
with, with, a, with a key ring on it, so we used that. And this was a flying, uh, sort of a tape flying leg, and we could see all the boots that were going on. So it was, it was you know, Kensington Market time and uh, fun and games, right? So then we'll move on, Chris. Yeah, yeah. Awesome <laughs> 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 I know him. If I let him off the hook, he's gonna st no, gonna just, stop. You know, no, just, uh, <laughs> but I think you should you should tell us about the, the what jeans meant at that time, really. Well, they were only coming into their own. There weren't so, a, so, yeah, the yeah. people wore them for comfort. Yes, you had the James Dean. Uh, that you had the, the Levi's following. Uh, it wasn't really the, the the craze that it then became. No. Um, this sort of spells it out. In 1970, we did the first designer gene. I don't think it set the world on fire. It was just something that happened, and, and it was quite successful. 1973 was quite interesting because um, I took I got some real denim from America and bleached. There was talk of bleaching, but it wasn't really bleached properly. So I bought buckets of bleach and bunch bleached these jeans in my bath and they bleached really nicely because it was proper denim so then I went to Hong Kong and I managed to find some American denim there because the local denim when you bleached it it turned mauve which I found out to my misfortune later on on a consignment but anyway the first few consignments were this American denim and I had some associate over here anyway he took it to America and the people called Britannia, they weren't even called Britannia at that time, got very excited and they imported it. I had some goods coming actually to the gene machine in London and they, re they redirected it to America. Yeah. And that's how Britannia started, which was a huge company, got to about a hundred million dollar turnover. Unfortunately, I was sort of left at the starting post after helping them along. <laughs> Those are the kind of stories you have in the clothing world. Um, but uh, so I really supposedly helped introduce bleach denim to America and then stretch denim which is really I think where it started Chris was yeah. the stretch denim somebody showed me some stretch denim in, in, when I was in the Far East uh, which was from the Japan and, and stretch denim had been around but not really it was blue just because it was blue and it stretched didn't make it stretch denim this was something that was really made by a, a top uh, one of the finest uh, Rather, one of the finest denim mills in Japan. And Japan really does know how to make denim. It always has in, in the traditional American way. And I had the ex technical experience because the, you would, this denim would shrink 20% right, when it was washed and that's what gave it its stretch. So that by cutting it in a certain way and allowing for the various stretches within the leg, you, you, you manage to uh, actually create this quite good profile. And at that time, the girls were wearing tight jeans in yeah. 78, you know, and but yeah. they were just tight and uncomfortable. And then you had, for example, uh, what was that film with um, Greece? Greece, yeah, with uh, Olivia Newton-John. <coughs> but they were, I think, they were stitched, stitched onto her or something because <laughs> they weren't. They were satin. So, uh, if you like, that's where uh, that's 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 where it all happened. So, and does that did that did that kind of doing that kind of drain pipe thing? Was that harking back to your beginning? Well, yes, I mean, we did actually two or three fits. Uh, we started off with a straight leg fit, which was for guys, and then um, uh, we did, in those days, jeans were unisex. They weren't even girls and men's particularly. And then we did a, a rock fit, which is what this one was, which was what you're talking about. Yeah, and then yeah. that's when all the rock guys got older and the girls, yeah. so that's the one that really yeah. took off. And it was black uh, twill as well, like this, not just blue denim. Oh, those are a couple of posters we did at the time. This one, this was done in the early, in, in, for the non-stretch gene on the left, because I had this Peter Golding, the greatest jeans on earth. I, we love circuses. I mean, it was just, it was magic. You can have fun. I mean, that was the whole point. It was fun. It, it was, King's Row was, was cooking. It was, it was, it was, nothing was serious, right? We didn't know how to make money, but we knew how to make product, and we knew how to have a good time. <laughs> And this, of course, is a great big one where girls stretch it, pushing the pushing the, uh, the car and, and the big stretch jeans. And this was actually in the underground, I think, in London Underground, which I unfortunately don't have one. Some huge uh, poster apart from this one. So uh, that, that was fun. So and uh, Richard Evans is still my pal. Did the one on the left, uh, and uh, he plays the harmonica as well. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. And then. I was going to ask you about that. You mentioned the King's yes. Road then, but yes. for most, a lot of people, we know, 
bless you, it's a little bit older, wouldn't know what the King's Road was like then if you went down there these days. That's right. There was a whole scene of itself. What was, yes. it, what was it like then? Well, I mean, you had it was rocking. Yeah. That was yeah. all there was to it. I mean, yeah. you had Ozzy Clark shop, you had... Yeah. Uh, there were butchers, there were actually, you know, green grocers. It was a local. Uh, slowly, boutiques uh, came into play there. Mary Corn had Bazaar, but that was, I think, in much earlier days. And yeah. It was, a, it, was a, it was a place to go. The Stones lived in Chelsea. Yeah. And it was just happening, Antiquarius, you know, little Happy sort of... Yeah. You know, oh, exactly. Yeah. And down the other end of the King's Road, you had Vivian Westwood. Uh, you had um, mm. uh, uh, Granny Takes a Trip, which was before, way yeah. before Ace. Yeah. So it was the local yeah. energy place. You had Michael Rainey's Hung On You. Yeah. Uh, so you had all these other shops, and we all took it in turns, if you like. Mm. Um, you had, uh, what's the name, the guy in um, South Walton Street? John. John. John Kay. John Kay's Ebony, that was mm. right. So he did menswear. So you had a few pockets of people doing their own thing, right? And uh, then they would last two or three years, and then somebody else would pick up and... We picked up sort of in the mid seventies and had a very glamorous clientele. That for me, it was it was a, my thing. I was already in the clothing world, doing jeans wear and shipping stuff for private label, which means you made it for other people. So, but I always wanted to do my own uh, my own sort of interpretation of what things were like. So, with mine was very much a sort of a Hollywood meets meets English aristocracy, which meet, means funk. It was sort of mixed yeah. together. So you had like. Glam and glitz and diamantes and cowboy shirts uh, and, and silver jeans and, yeah. and, and leather and velvet and just, it was all fun, it was great it, and it was good quality too, as we always used to say, we were never, never owingly oversold, <laughs> so quite expensive. But it used to, you know, today it would be cheap as chips, but in those days it wasn't that expensive either, but it was really good, we had different girls coming in doing stuff, there was... Shami Sheila, I remember, who we used to give her these person's names, and she used to take sh sort of American red squaw sort of Indian looks and make beaded things in lovely chamois leather. And then there was another girl uh, who uh, I remember her nickname after, uh, who, who used to take old little old denims uh, d uh, and and chop them sh into shorts and put jungle jungle jeer June or whatever her name was, and she'd have a cut out elephants and tigers and it's just jungle stuff all over and then it was Janice Bell who was another supplier of ours who's still around and she used to take old jeans and put put sort of old dresses and hang them off so there was a whole it was a spirit and it wasn't fashion I think that's the point fashion is, is sort of almost it's not such a wonderful word it was more being it was clothes it was design it was fun it was spirit and of course we attracted a, a lot of uh, a lot of people, because, and unknowingly, and there were no paparazzi, by the way, hanging around, and just got all the guys in. I mean, here, you can see there's, you know, a few of them there, I'm sure you notice there's one Stuart and Keith and uh, Elton John and everybody else, right? and, and Freddie Mercury. This was some of the stuff we would do. These would be t-shirts that we'd cut a hole in, satin trousers but they they had the lot they cross over like the army men's army clothes so there was always a mixture of authenticity i think that's something that i found to be really important in, in clothes for me if it has an authentic base and then you play with it you know it's like mixing blues rock and roll and reggae it's still in the mix you know uh and, and i think that's to me what i find in design and then it makes it long lasting so you know if, if they still fitted you you could wear the same pants today uh, and, um, and, and that was uh, I think some bustiers we used to get in and this was Teddy who was our amazing manager he was fantastic and he looked he'd wearing a hat and boots and he was great with it he was better with the rock and rollers than I was when they went and sort of Freddie Mercury would come in and they'd all stand at the doorway and come in Freddie got this for you and if he knew somebody was coming he I says Teddy what are you taking all that stuff downstairs for he says, no, 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 I've got so-and-so coming. He says, when they come, I run up and say, look, I've just got this, it just arrived. <laughs> <laughs> he was lovely. And uh, that's Francis. Uh, this picture, I think, Francis of Donna. That's Francis again. There's another one we still see around. She was lovely. So we had this gang of girls and guys that would like to work there, and that was What, what was your most uh, sort of extravagant piece that you made? If you can think about one. There was a one jacket out. with bananas all over it, leather bananas. <laughs> there was another one with Punch and Judy. We had a guy that could make amazing leatherware. Mm. Um, 
we had all these people, you see, and they, we, we'd, we'd guide them what we wanted, but they wanted to work. We had a guy, David Stoller, that would do all the diamantes. David want this and this, this soul, and can you... And it, but it was all, it was stylish. It wasn't scruffy, and I don't think it was, it was, it wasn't rude. It might have been sensual rather than sexy, you know. And then, of course, every girl thought she was getting the only dress that we had left, and then they'd go down to trance, and there'd be three of them wearing the same dress. <laughs> it was trance more than Annabelle's, I suppose, that was our... Uh, our uh, venue in those days. And this is then when we closed it, and nothing lasts forever, and things moved on, and we uh, closed in mid, in, in, we, after 10 years, <coughs> mid 80s. So we did a big ad called Ace Goodbyes, actually in Ritz magazine, which was owned by um, uh, David, David Bailey, Bailey, that's right, and uh, yeah, that's no, 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 David Litchfield. And uh, anyway, this, these are some pictures that Richard Young kindly lent me to use uh, in the presentation, although they are copyright. But that sort of shows you the kind, the kind of people that were coming into our shop. You had Marion that came in to buy belts, and you had Keith, and I mean, you, you can I don't even say go through it as uh, uh, you name them. Go on. Steve Strange, is Jack Nicholson, uh, Mick Jagger. And you get the local Kings Road aristocrats and it yeah. was Chelsea was there and it was all a mixture and people I'll pay you next week and yeah. guys with their girlfriends. But the Kings Road was mad though, wasn't it? Yeah, people it was used fun. to come to the top in best dressed in their best clothes and just yes. walk from one end to the next and then back again. Well you had the old punks down there at the same time. Yeah, right? yeah, well also the fifties thing in the pink suits and and all that was at the same time as you were doing this. I was interested, it was that marriage of things, it was almost like a Roxy music, some glitter yes. 50s, wasn't it? Yes, really, I suppose, yes. Thing. Uh -huh. So it was fun, and then there's the same again, more of them, and then it was Jilly Johnson, that they, they were called Blonde on Blonde, Jilly Johnson and Nina Carter, mm -hmm. and they were the tightest leather, silver leather trousers, they looked amazing, you know, and they would get a lot of press, and so it it was it was great. It was fun, and and I think London was fun. Although it was a serious business, uh, and we still had people robbing us, uh, you know, <laughs> robbing to order. <laughs> and if we ever caught one, it would be wonderful. But we only caught some silly little girl. I think somebody caught a few. So then after Ace, although we uh, carried on, and at the same time I was still, whilst Ace was happening, I was still sort of in the jeans world. To the wider public. So this was something we were doing in America. This was, what does that say? Fiji, UK. USA in the 80s and 90s. So we, we, how are we doing on time? Uh, time. Okay, so, so otherwise can spend... Okay, <laughs> so we're all right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, on the, that's again the genes in America, which I did have some pretty good success with, uh, because America, when they get hold of something, they love it, and uh, it happens, and we have distributors there, and we ship them from the Far East, and I had that little um, plate that I created to sort of be an identity and a profile stitch. Again, I took the profile stitch from a cowboy boot. You know, it was always an authentic, I guess that's why I really, still to this day, whenever I do design, which isn't that much easier, you, you put various things together and it becomes something else. I think that's why a lot of the longevity in the music world, people inspire from. And, 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 and respect, the respect, it's not just a, taking something, not taking a bit of Frank Sinatra and putting it with a bit of punk and thinking it's going to work. You've got to love Frank Sinatra and you've got to love punk and then you might subconsciously create a third thing. The idea is a bit <laughs> far-reaching, but it works. Well, <laughs> it's it's it? Yes, you know, because you, you take the essence of what each one has and, and, and you put it together, you're the sort of you're the medium through which it works, just like all art really is, is a medium of what went past and what you take to the future. And uh, these, then we had a different crowd in America for the Peter Golding jeans, and this was Guns N' Roses, Madonna, they'd all go to their uh, distributor's um, warehouse or their, their stylist ward and they'd get jeans for the bands and uh, Rolling Stone, Janet Jackson, or, I mean all the Osborne Kiss, you can see by by who's there, Fleetwood Mac, you can see the character of that particular period of the 80s. I mean, that was real fun. And again, the girls pushing the car and photographs and a bit of leftovers from Ace with the uh, Diamante Velvet jeans. Don't you have a pair of Velvet jeans somewhere other? 
design work that I was doing at that time. Uh, you can see a lot of it is, is, is traditional base but with its own thing. I think to remember that uh, this would be for other companies or for my own brand. The, that would be a trench coat but it would be in denim. So you take a traditional trench coat but you make it in denim so it have a certain feel of its own and you, uh, with little bits and pieces or uh, this would be the profile stitch or um, that one in the middle would be uh, sort of a little pocket and a slant pocket. So you might mix various components together. France was quite a good influence in those days too. I'd go to France a lot and look around and see what was all going on. And when nobody was looking, I'd take a button off a jacket <laughs> and try and get it copied. Nothing more than that. Who's going to sure? <laughs> I admit I'm yeah. storing it up now. I feel much better. <laughs> <laughs> and that, for example, would be a western shirt, but it would be on the back of a jean. That sold really well, actually, because you had your curve pockets, smile pockets, as they called them. But it would be on a jean as opposed to on the, the shirt at the top. Uh, and the shirt. And the thing is, with all these western shirts and things, you have to make them perfectly. I've seen a lot of stuff around today, and they just copy the, a picture. But the, 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 the designer may not even know what they're copying. The, the production manager has never seen one. And then they end up in the shop and, and they don't sell because the, the proportions are wrong, the way they're stitched, the feeling, the spirit, the life of it has to be so mm -hmm. important, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what I felt that. Uh, you know, and what do you think with designing? Do you think a lot of the ideas are sort of in the zeitgeist and they just floating around and then all of a sudden you see somebody and they've got a similar idea to yours and you go, yes. wow, or do you see the people first? Because a lot of ideas, they just seem to materialise out of nowhere. Well, I think you're right, Chris. I mean, you've got this, you get that sort of, maybe everybody's wearing dungarees, and then in the dungaree there's a pocket, and then suddenly yeah. three people have used that. And there, there yeah. is a, I think the underground uh, has a lot to do with it. And in your day, you had a very strong yeah. underground scene. Yeah. And people yeah. would dress individually, right? Yeah, but still, see the thing with this, for example, I was about in America, and I'm sure there were people who didn't even know each other, never saw each other ever, dressed almost the same in San Francisco. Yes. as they were in London, without having seen any press or any advertisements. That's the idea I want about people arriving at the same conclusion at the same time without any... Uh, well, you get that. There's a spirit in the air. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it's, like uh, it's, it's, it's like, why were boats made by uh, in, in, in some island and, and 3,000 miles away, uh, similar boats were being made uh, 2,000 years ago and there was yeah. no connection. Yeah, or, yeah, half of water. <laughs> yeah, but, they, but they, they wouldn't have been there, you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. get this, and that's that's great, you know, there's yeah. a spirit in the air, and, uh, yeah. and so be it, then this was probably the more construction, that was more straightforward, you had to sort of play the game, and, and you can't be too outlandish, also, if you're in the industry, they're, they're, you're here, particularly if I have clients, I always say to my clients, they have to, you know, jobs design, a job is to help you sell, oh, they used to cyber relief, always get me, usually get me the job. <laughs> uh, although I do remember going on for one, one, uh, to see one client who's a very wealthy, they made, I think they made, dun no, they made uh, duffel coats or something, it was an old traditional thing and somebody took me along and I said, well, you know, this is the presentation that I do and, uh, you know, uh, this is the kind of work that I can do for you, this is, we, we take a study, we see where you're going, we see the kind of marketing, what kind of fabrics, where you manufacture and we try and bring it along, but obviously respecting your traditional uh, clientele and the guy said to me how much will that be and I saw so much a season he says look Mr. Golding he says I may be a millionaire he says but I'm not going to buy something I can't see <laughs> 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 so that was the end of that <laughs> so we do have those uh, stories too but uh, you know uh, that would be like a, there's a triple a double pocket that's a, with a triple snap, snap and this, this would be uh, a waistcoat which wouldn't normally go with this kind of workwear but uh, it's more of a photographer sort of more of a hunting uh, yeah, feel. Yeah. so you could mix the bits together and there might be slant pockets instead of uh, the usual curved and 
that painted jacket's got raglan sleeves. The Japanese were very good as well at taking traditional uh, clothing. So I'd have bundles of old clothes uh, that I'd be, you know, which I learned from uh, uh, the Italians. They'd all, you go to the Italians, they had all the old joppers and jackets and things. And it's a mixture of stitching and, and it's like if you're in the film business, you're going to watch old films all day long and you're going to borrow inspirations and put them into them, they become your own. And uh, uh, I think it's a respect for the past uh, takes you to the present. And that's triple stitch. So this was all a story about triple stitch. And that label, I seem to remember, came from a cigar box label because cigar box labels are amazing. <laughs> you know, they were done years and years ago. A lot of them are gold leaf and they're very carefully done. And you're turning, you know, turn of the century, and they it's like orange box labels too. And I love books on circuses, so all these various uh, inspirations are uh, really great, you know. And uh, I remember that one particularly, you know, it was a two color job which worked well, and uh, so that was not that, that's where that came from. What's this? Oh, here's a video for you. I'm going to read the room. <laughs> the Cabinet of Green. This, this uh, before we go on to this, um, it was my birthday, so my girlfriend at the time and my three sons gave me a monster card. It said, um, slightly, if I may indulge slightly, uh, happy birthday, a day in the studio, because <laughs> they knew I wanted to do some music and I never quite sort of uh, realised that dream. And I was into Freddie King at the time, who's one of the greatest bluesmen of our era. Um, and uh, anyway, I took a day in the studio and it wasn't quite enough, so I ended up thousands of pounds later <laughs> <laughs> with this. <laughs> Here we go, let it rock. <laughs> so we did a, we did a c CD and then we, uh, we then thought, well, this isn't good enough, and there was a launch it. The man who eased us into stretch denim is combining his passion for fashion with a music career. He's just released a blue CD, which he unveiled to a celebrity audience at London's Café de Paris. Peter Golding and the jeans are inseparable. I mean, you could take that two ways. One, that um, he's never been able to be separated from the first pair of jeans he ever wore. But um, secondly, he was the first man ever to do stretch jeans, stretch denim. So you had this incredible stretch tie that fit like a, a glove gee, that was just unbelievable and it was denim. And he was brilliant and he did it. And I was lucky enough to be in Hong Kong when he first launched it. Peter has a growing celebrity clientele which includes Mick Jagger, Jerry Moore, Rod Stewart, Marion Faithful and Joe Collins. I can walk in all the time. A drink in a champagne and yes I'm just about feeling so blind Or fashion, fashion, fashion When Peter came along with Stretch Denim Basically it was the answer that everyone was looking for If you wanted sexy denim And Stretch was the only way you got it It's all to do with rock and roll And rock and roll is to do with sex And sex is to do with jeans And jeans are to do with jeans the thing about these jeans is that everybody nowadays takes jeans so seriously, you know, they, they, this season particularly, they're you know, the new thing for so many top designers and so many people have branched into jeans. And, um, and jeans are not a serious thing, they're to be worn every day by people who want to have fun and be relaxed. And the thing is, they're really camp, I mean, he does like the most amazing kind of flower print jeans and snake skin print jeans and it's just they're really tight and stretchy and sexy and they look really good in girls with fuller figures and they and they suit the music as well. They look brilliant with the girls jiving and you know Peter Gilding stretch jeans. And it's just kind of a fun concept and it's nice that it's not too serious. They had Ace at the King's Road. And uh, it was his first PR he said tonight over to Good, fun, fun. I mean there was always something happening in this great vibe show and there were all these trendy Peter's one of my oldest and dearest friends I've ever had, ever. And um, I was staying with him last year, and he made his record. 
So since I was living rent free at his house, I figured I should offer my services to plan his record. And then he got released. Everybody was anyone who has PG and Gs. So look at all these girls wearing PG and Gs, you know? And they just wouldn't let anything touch their body. Tell me who's which friends of yours you know that wear PG and Gs. Keith and Ronnie. Uh, I know uh, all, all the guys in Van Halen wear them. I think the guys in Guns N' Roses. Every girl and every woman, you know, kind of in the gym, they exercise. They don't want to wear a pair of jeans and kind of bags or bags. You want jeans that just fit you, you know. And being a girl, being a stretch denim, it does the job. I'm never quite able to say this. It's the first time I've ever said it. I'd like to play the title track from our latest and only album, Stretch in the Blues. That was because, I mean, what have we seen for the last, I don't know how many years now, but I think all skinny jeans, aren't they? Those ridiculously tight ones. That, yeah, I think so. I it's been dominating everything for, for the last few years. Putting that together, that was about half an hour that we managed to squeeze into five minutes of room for you. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, the other thing was there, but you saw the fabric of the, the different yeah. silver, and it was people having fun and enjoying themselves. That was a great moment in time. I really enjoyed that. CD still available on <laughs> <laughs> on Amazon for one pound. <laughs> I think about ten quid. Or yeah. Yeah. Well worth it. Is it free postage? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, so I suppose we're going to carry on. But well, you're rock the rock art now. That's because uh, that's one of the Let's go. Okay. Here we oh, go. The then we got a bit smart, and yes. Bloomberg did an interview actually more similar at the same time about. Uh, fashion and what it meant, so we didn't bore you with this uh, particular movie, so this is just a shot out of it. And, and my, my hair got a bit out of hand. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but the guy sort of asked me about the various keys and where it came from and, uh, and how it relates and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and, uh, so it's quite a good look. Quite annoyed in that photograph. Well, yeah. They asked you silly, they ask you silly, <laughs> silly questions, you know. And you have to explain. You know, well, what is a genius? You know, why am I having to interview you? <laughs> so there we go. Next one. What have you got there? Chris, that was something that I did for for Playboy. Uh, I, we used, I used to know the people at Playboy and. Um, never quite got to design their stuff because they, they had very expensive licenses that they wanted you to take up. But basically invited me to uh, be part of their 50th anniversary in New York, which um, also was, uh, they invited various other designers, Vivian Westwood and Versace and Donatella and this one and that one. And they asked me, would I represent, each one representing sort of an area of fashion, and would I represent uh, denim, stretch denim, denim. So I thought, what the hell can I do? So I got some denim and I made this evening coat he, he, the, and, and trousers, as you can see, with it was a silver line, a uh, golden line, a big embroidery of label of bunnies all over it. it. Looked pretty good. And then I, we made a few of them. And I think they sold in Henry Vendell's. They were having a little store and met Hugh Hefner and all the rest of five seconds. And uh, it was all pretty glam. Uh, and uh, that was that. <laughs> and this is this. Yeah. But no, but it was very good. And it really helped as a sort of promotional thing. And I was quite proud to be involved with that, I must say. You know, it's quite sort of, I think he's quite an amazing guy that helped me through the years. You know, and he's, apart from the bunny and all that stuff, he actually did take a lot of good causes of jazz and, 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 and 
various uh, women's rights and other things and, and, and did quite a lot to help America in its quite traditional, you know, he was quite anti-establishment in his way. What, Chris? What well, he got anti-establishment wrong. He's clearly with garb in his pyjamas, that's why I like him. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Well, th this was just uh, more of the commercial end yeah. uh, stuff we did mid, mid. I'm, I'm retired a few years ago, but this was sort of mid 2000s, and that was the brochures that we had. You can still see the same feel. Uh, that would be a quality sort of ribbed T-shirt. This was, I think, denim. You can see the curved pockets there with a bit of leather trim and the three button on the jacket. Change the logos a bit. Have you ever tempted to do it again at that, that, that Well, it seems quite timely. So I know. Uh, it would be great if, if I could license to somebody that really wants to do it. And uh, we were talking to one or two people because it's obviously a great opportunity to take the spirit of yesterday and take it into tomorrow. But you need people that believe in yesterday and have the ability to take it into tomorrow. And it has meaning. And right. uh, uh, a lot of brands that have done that, Burberry's mm -hmm. or whatever, have been very successful. So there are possibilities which, yeah. uh, you know, I'd be. Can we stretch down? Was this something that you could have patented? No, unfortunately not. It's not like writing a song, which is unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you can't really patent. In fact, the clothing world, the only really patent is, is textile design, because the judge can decide. Yeah. <coughs> you can't hold up a pair of pajamas and say, well, I designed that yeah. uh, button. Yeah. You can, but you get involved in, in a lot yeah. of um, problems. That's mm. why mm. licensing and, and brands is quite important. Yeah. Because with Gloria Vanderbilt, I mean, she took the things to leave straight out of the old yeah, degree, didn't she? Yeah, they did. They, they all took it along, and it? you couldn't really go that. But the Americans had the power. And yeah, of course. And the yeah. Calvin Kleins, they do have that power, and they rule the world in, in atom bombs and... and, and uh, At the end, it's all about lawyers, uh, Peter. Exactly, it's really. lawyers and lawyers. armies. And you're going to uh, pay the lawyer you'll win. <laughs> We're just <laughs> humble rockers, <laughs> earning a crust. <laughs> Uh, this was something Hillary Alexander did, which was great. In 2003, I suddenly woke up to the fact that it was 25 years of, of, of stretched jeans from 1978. And she got Jerry, which was great. Jerry happy to do it because she'd been on my clients. And David Bailey, she knew, and they, they, he was working for the Telegraph at the time. So there was this little, um, and I think Jerry was doing, she had the, uh, she was doing, she was in the theatre in the West End at the time, so she came along uh, and we rushed her to David Bailey's studio and had the photographs done. It was really sweet of her and I appreciate that. Um, hello? Your rock, your rock oh. art collection next, isn't it? Oh, oh, oh more. There you go, more. Okay. <laughs> Oh, there we are. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think at this time it was pretty timely. I mean, I'm surprised that it didn't, it didn't get uh, international distribution. Yeah, well, well I mean, what I was running my own business, and yeah. it's very hard with a sort of limited setup to be to compete, which was then became in the eight, in the eighties and two thousands, with yeah. huge conglomerates. I mean, just you can't do it. Well, that's you know, and, and it's just like yeah. a little grocery shop gets taken over by by Tesco, and you yeah. can't manage it, and you know. Uh, then you get calamities like you get today with in the, yeah. in the food chain, and you, and you get in the clothing world, you get sort of a, a banality of a product, yeah. and they're all the same with different labels, and uh, and, and nobody yeah. knows what's what, and then it's price and yeah. all the rest of it, and there's no shops left. It's also oh, the changing of the change of media. <laughs> it's the change of media. <laughs> But there's an energy, and the kids are out there doing their thing, and uh, we, we move on, and other people come in and take our place. Which is good. This was Tamara Beckwith, that she was great. She did a two or three PR seasons for me, and wrote in, in the Hello magazine, and that was Sports for International, mm -hmm. and a few stars knocking around there. And, uh, um, what's the next? Don't ask me, I'm used to this with people. Caprice, okay. that was one, and that was uh, oh, yes, yes, the one yes. on the left. Uh, Liz, uh, Liz Hurley. Liz Hurley, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> she used to live above my friend, and she was, about, she was like a 14 stone punk rocker when I first met her, and then all of a sudden she appeared. Anyway, it's well, I mean, Chris, you know, you, you've been part of this world, and the energy of, the, of British culture <coughs> you've known only too well. You've mapped it right the way through. So yeah. it's just one part was going on. Meanwhile, yeah. down the road, there was another culture happening. Of course, absolutely. I mean, I used to see all those, those people wandering in and out of your shop uh, yes. yeah. down the King's Road, you know. I could never afford it, Peter. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs>
Any left? Is that it? No, you should have your... Uh, oh, your, yeah, no, this... We'll just touch on this, because uh, I, I sort of... Whilst I was doing all this, I was quite into collecting rock and roll art and delved a bit more than I should have done. And uh, from a few posters from going down to the UFO club in the 60s, uh, we, uh, I collected a few more posters and then I managed to buy uh, some Rick Griffin uh, art. In America, Rick Griffin had died, but he, his estate was selling the, the most amazing collection <laughs> of, um, of rock and roll art that he'd done. I'm talking about the art for the posters, not the posters. So. That, uh, that was the excitement. Is you got the connection, the, the starting point rather than the finish. And I, mm -hmm. and so I started collecting that. And then we had a show at Sotheby's in 2003, and this was something we did in New York. So you can get the feel of it. I mean, this is a German. This is a poster, but it's just amazing. You get the idea when thought and love and care. I and mean, this is phenomenal. Jimi Hendrix really looking like the Medusa fantastically well. And that's the Marcus of Bath and and uh, one of the chair. What's it? Yeah. No, 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 what's his name? Oh, it's Noah. Noah. No, Noah. No, 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 Jack Gallagher. Yeah. Yeah. He was great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a few others. So, it's all down here. I think yeah, there's been a bit of a there. There. Don't you think that thing was yeah. six foot tall, and this was a great big thing. Some of it's got sold, some of it's going <laughs> into auction soon. Uh, what else we got here? Then I kept the music thing going. I think that's really kept my spirit going. It's, it's quite something that's important to me. Um, I love the community of musicians, and uh, I love, uh, apart from the rock and the blues, uh, Django Reinhardt is something, the uh, French swing that I love so much. And uh, that's some of the T-Bones. I had a band which we did in 2010. We're still doing it. Cafe Django, still yeah. rocking. It's funny um, that you should have ended up in the places that you would have gone to all those years ago, like the Cucumber, for example, yeah. and, and also the Hunter Club. After all, after all, you know, so you've gone back to your roots, really, I guess. Right, and he, uh, I mean, her family's from way back, uh, uh, played with Django Reinhardt in the, in the old days. So, you know, there's still the connections that flow through and, and the spirit of the music. I think that sort of brings people together as well. You get all these pockets of communities. And then, of course, you've got your pop world, which is almost the same as the pop fashion, and it just yeah. turns around and it's very commercial. And I suppose you have the same in the art world and everything else. But anyway, I think... Is there any link between your music and your design work? Well, yeah, yeah, in the old days, yes, because jeans wear was, was rock and roll, it was what the cowboys wore, and yeah. cowboy music, western swing, you had yeah. railroad, railroad was with boogie woogie with guys in working the railroads yeah, yeah. and wearing uh, work wear, uh, so yes, there was always, uh, and of course there's always, a, every music, you know better yeah. than I do, has its own fashion. Of course, yeah. I mean, yeah. your speciality of punk had a certain yeah. look, which yeah. I wasn't particularly involved in, you probably know a lot more about that. Yeah. I touched on it. Just look at me now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is the new punk. Oh, it's it's the new punk. New for the last 30 right. years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the brand, just in case you've forgotten it. <laughs> 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 and that's about it, guys. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I really thank you. Thank you very much indeed for coming along. You've been a fantastic audience. And I've just got one thing more to add, I suppose, which is. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs>